language typology is about studying the cross-linguistic patterns we see in languages and trying to understand what the reasons for those patterns are. And that can be actually extremely difficult. So an example I like to use is the word order patterns in the world's languages. So in, I think it's about 60% of the world's languages, the standard word order is subject, object, verb. So the question is, why do 60% of the world's languages have that word order? And there are a lot of different types of explanations you can give for this. So one possible explanation is that it's just a historical accident. Maybe it's because these 60% of the world's languages come from these particular couple of families and these families happen to get big. Another explanation might be human cognition. Maybe there's something about putting the subject first and the object first and the verb last that is like really salient to how humans think about events. But if that's the case, it becomes really difficult to explain why it is that 60% of the world's languages do this, but not 80% or all of them or none of them, right? If this really is something that gives us like a, some sort of cognitive advantage or if it's cognitively easier, why hasn't it been selected out of language yet? So these are the kind of questions that we're answering in language typology. Within typology, one of the most important topics, and I might be a little biased on this because I did my dissertation on it, but within typology, I think one of the most important questions and issues in the field right now is the issue of parts of speech because we're discovering that parts of speech vary extremely widely across languages. It really gets at kind of the fundamental issue of what does it mean to categorize things in language? And that gets at the broader issues of human cognition and human categorization. Like categorization is something fundamental to human cognition. So looking at cross-linguistic patterns about how languages structure their categories can give us insights into how human cognition works. And I think that's very exciting. And that's why we're gonna talk about it today. A very, very brief overview. Now, some of the issues in parts of speech studies. What are parts of speech? Obvious place to start. So first, a couple uh, terminological points. So there are a lot of different terms that get used to talk about parts of speech. Um, and in fact, linguists these days don't really like to talk about parts of speech very much. We prefer to use terms like word classes or lexical or grammatical categories. So you'll hear these talked about as lexical categories a lot. These are how we categorize the lexical words in a language. Like we divide up the lexicon and we divide up the vocabulary of a language into classes based on their behavior. And those are usually uh, opposed to functional categories. So those would be um, more grammatical categories like articles, for example, or determiners. Unfortunately, the terminology gets confusing because sometimes the term grammatical categories gets used to mean lexical categories. You just kind of have to keep that in mind as you're reading the literature on it. But that's actually why I prefer the term word classes, because this is looking about how we divide up words in a language, regardless of whether they're lexical or functional words. And the way we do this in linguistics is not the way you were necessarily taught in your English class in school. You know, you were taught like person, place, or thing as a noun, right? Well, in linguistics, being a science, we have to back our observations about language with scientific evidence. So our theories about what the parts of speech are in language need to be based on observations about the behavior of words in a language. We have a number of different tests for that. And these tests put together are what are called the distributional method. So for any given word, we look at its distributions. We look to see what suffixes it can occur with. We look to see um, what slots in a sentence it can occur with. What are its effects on the surrounding words, right? So these are syntactic tests. These are morphological tests. And these are behavioral tests in the sense of like, how does this behave in the context of like, these other words? Does it affect these other words or not? So that's a distributional method. And it's kind of the only method we have to look at parts of speech, to look at word classes, right? Because we have to base these classes on how language actually behaves. We can't really take semantic criteria into account precisely because it's so vague and varies so much across languages. Like we talk about a noun being a person, place, or thing, but I can say running, that's a noun. I like running, 
right? So that's an action. That's not a person, place, or thing. It doesn't even work. These semantic criteria don't even work within English, let alone being consistent across languages, right? There are some languages that things that we would call adjectives in English are analyzed as verbs, like to be blue. Clearly, like the semantic definitions of adjectives in English are not going to work in this language, where a word like to be blue behaves more like verbs than nouns. So that's kind of one of the fundamental issues in parts of speech research, is how do we identify these word classes across languages? It's hard enough to identify them within English, but how can we map these categories of English onto Spanish or Swahili or Latin or whatnot? And this is a real methodological issue for linguists because all of the criteria we use to figure out what counts as like a noun in English is language specific. So if I say that a noun is something that can take plural marking, for example, well, that works pretty well for English. We'll just maybe set aside for a moment the cases of singular only nouns like sheep or plural only nouns like pants, right? Those cause problems for that definition already, but we'll just set them aside for the moment. Even if you say that nouns are things that can be plural, that causes problems cross-linguistically because there are some languages that don't mark plural on nouns. So the Chirimacha language, which is a language in Louisiana that I work with, only a small set of human animate nouns take plural marking. And that plural marking isn't really plural marking. It's actually, those are forms that are all derived from verbs. It's a verbal derivational suffix. It's not technically a plural. So Chirimacha nouns don't mark singular and plural. So that criteria right there doesn't work. Criterion from English doesn't work for chitty matcha. You could say that like a verb is something that takes tense marking, right? Well, in a lot of languages, they have not a lot, but there are languages that have things called nominal tense. So you can take the same tense marker that you would use for like past tense on a verb, and you can stick it on a noun, and it would mean like my past wife or my late wife. So you can't even say that something like tense is unique to verbs. And even in the case of like plurals, even in languages that do have plurals, plurality is something that gets marked on verbs too. And it's not just plurality of the participants. It's not like plural subject, plural object. The verbs can have what are called um, event number, often ta talked about as pluractionality. And so you can have like a plural marker on the verb, which means that the event happened multiple times. So, you know, plurality is not a good diagnostic either. So you can begin to immediately see why applying these criteria cross-linguistically is so difficult. And we already talked about some of the semantic criteria and how difficult that makes this cross-linguistic identification. So not only do we have this issue across languages, but even language internally, we have this problem too. And the reason for this is that every lexical item, every vocabulary item in a language has slightly different distribution and behavior. And I do mean every item. Here's a, a quick example that doesn't exactly exemplify that last point, but it just shows that how even within a language, it can be really difficult to say that, you know, this stem, this word, this lexeme is a specific part of speech. So this is the Nuchanath language, which is a Wakashan language spoken in the Pacific Northwest. This entire region is really known for having very fluid kind of boundaries between what you might want to analyze as noun, verb, and adjective. And no one's really kind of come up with conclusive ways of defining noun, verb, and adjective in these languages. Side note, what's really interesting is that there's several language families in the area that all do this, and these are unrelated language families. So this pattern has been borrowed into these languages, like this part of speech fluidity is an aerial feature. It's been borrowed across these languages. Wicked cool. So in Nushanoth here, this is kind of a classic example. You have a stem meaning two, and it can be used as a referent predicate or a modifier in each of these examples. So in the first example, it's uh, he swallowed two of them. So it's being used as a referent. He swallowed the two. And there's a great example of a past tense marker on a noun, by the way. So like the two past people that are dead now because they were swallowed. These are from some traditional legends in the language. In the second example, you have a predicate, a verb. So they became two. So you have that same stem. It has an inceptive marker on it, like a becoming. And in the final example, it's being used as a modifier, pretty similar to how we would use it in English. They put two wolves on their back. So you can see how difficult it is. How would you classify 
the stem to in this language, noun, verb, or adjective. Obviously, you need to look at the language as a whole and kind of figure out your diagnostics, but in my opinion, nobody's really successfully been able to do that yet. It gets a little more complicated. So this is some data from Russian. And these are numbers in Russian. And on the left, you can see a number of different kind of grammatical features. So does the number word agree with the noun in syntactic number? Does the number word agree in case throughout the clause? Does it agree in gender? And so you can go through and you can look at each of these numbers and the number one does all of these features, but the number two only does some of those features. And the number three does fewer of those features and five and so on up till you have the word a million. And at that point, a million behaves much more like uh, a noun than any sort of like modifier. It doesn't have any of these other um, properties. And so you have this kind of smooth continuum of like adjective-y like numbers all the way up to noun-y like numbers in Russian. So are numbers in Russian adjectives or nouns? There's no easy answer to that question. So even when you use distributional methods like this to look at the morphosyntactic evidence within a language, it's really difficult to come up with concise, like clearly delineated categories that have the are that are like mutually exclusive and have necessary and sufficient conditions to them. Another quick example of this, no surprise, comes from English. This is a study from David Crystal back in 1967. And same kind of thing. It's just on the top are all these features and on the left are all the words, and you can see how each of these words differs in the particular features it participates in. So it causes that same kind of problem. And so there have been all sorts of tedious debates in the literature about, well, maybe we should make a subcategory for these ones, or lump these together into like a super category, or, you know, like how do we deal with this? So one of the prominent kind of responses to this problem that's been given comes from uh, William Croft, who uh, does a lot of great work in language typology and what's called construction grammar. And the construction grammar approach in general doesn't take languages to have these like big kind of monolithic categories like noun, verb, and adjective. The way construction grammar approaches it instead is it's this idea that when we learn a language, we learn this like huge complicated network of interlapping and overlapping constructions, like individual kind of pieces of grammar. So we know about like the past tense ed construction, you know, that suffix is a construction. We know about a particular word and that word is a construction. We might know about kind of phrasal constructions. We might know about like the is verbing construction. And we know that that gets used for, you know, aspect, right? But we also know things like the ED construction doesn't apply to all words. We know that some words have a special past tense. We have like this incredibly rich and detailed and word specific knowledge of all these grammatical constructions. And so we have, the, and some of them are kind of like sub constructions of other ones. So you can imagine this kind of big network model as how this is conceptualized. So for construction grammarians like William Croft, we don't have parts of speech in English. What we have instead is constructions that are closer or far away from certain cognitive prototypes that we have. And this graphic on the right here is uh, how he schematizes that. When you have an object, like a physical tangible thing in the world, and you're using that object in discourse to refer to something, that's the most prototypical kind of canonical use of that word, right? So if I take the word apple and I use it in discourse to refer to an apple, so it's like the topic of conversation, I don't need to do anything special with it, right? I, I like That's exactly the use I would have expected with it. I don't have to put any special marking on it. I don't have to give it a suffix or this or that. I don't have to do some complicated word ordering thing. That's just how you would expect an object to be used in language. But if you start to use the word apple to do other things, like as a verb, then suddenly you do start to need to mark it in special ways, right? So if for some reason you came up with a verb apple, right? You say like, oh, he appled it over there, or he, or maybe you would say something like he did an apple, like to someone, whatever, I have no idea, you know, maybe, I, we're, let's not even imagine what that could mean. But when you start doing that, these situations become more marked. And they can be marked in the sense of literally taking another suffix or prefix. They can be marked in the sense of being semantically marked, 
they can have an additional component to their meaning that they didn't have when they didn't have this more prototypical use. They could also be syntactically marked or prosodically marked. There can be, you know, uh, some sort of prosodic emphasis on it, right? And so his whole approach is the idea that when the use of an item in discourse aligns with how we think of it cognitively, that's when we tend to mark it the least. And sure enough, that pattern holds across languages. We haven't found any counter evidence to this yet. When you see a modifying concept, like a property concept like yellow or big being used to do modification in discourse to describe like a feature of something else, then it tends to not be marked. Now, sometimes it is, but it's, it's always the least marked of all the possible options. So when you have like an object being used to refer, you know, it might have some marking on it, but an object being used to modify is going to have at least that much marking, probably more. And so it's this kind of interesting implicational universal. So this is kind of a very complex implicate, like multidimensional implicational universal about, you know, if something is marked for a certain use, then it's going to be at least as marked as um, a more prototypical use. And so that's one of the kind of the really maybe exciting developments that have come out of the typology of parts of speech in the past like 30 years maybe, precisely because this gets at like how humans categorize things. So this ties in very, very nicely with what we know as prototype theory. There's all sorts of really good empirical evidence from psycholinguistics and psychology in general that humans uh, think in terms of prototypes. So evidence for this, for example, is that if you ask someone to list furniture and you don't tell them anything else other than list furniture, the first items that they tend to list will be the most prototypical types of furniture. They'll also be, humans will also be quicker to recognize the more prototypical ones. Various other experiments have shown that like these, these prototypes have salience. Whereas like a penguin tends to be like a non-prototypical bird, it wouldn't be recognized as quickly, it wouldn't be listed as quickly if you ask someone to list all of the birds. And so what's interesting about this approach to parts of speech is that it kind of captures that prototype approach to thinking about language and parts of speech. So a prototypical object is one that's used to refer. And maybe the less prototypically you're using that word in speech, the more marked it has to be in language. So this is a really interesting perspective because it says that languages themselves don't have parts of speech. Parts of speech instead are kind of this like emergent set of patterns that we see across languages that result from how we categorize the world. So I think parts of speech wind up being just an, an, an awesome example of how it is that typology can really inform how language works, right? And also like why it gets that way. So this raises all sorts of really interesting questions about like how do parts, parts of speech emerge in the first place, right? Um, you know, how, how does our cognition affect language to the point that these things kind of start to become fossilized in the grammar? And so, and what are kind of all of the latent results of this happening in language and how can we kind of see this hidden all over language? And, some, and it's not until you kind of step back and you start to look at a whole bunch of languages that you start to see these patterns emerge, you start to see these implicational universals emerge that hint at how human cognition works. So I find that very exciting.